My son and youngest child is starting college. Friends tell me the best cure for empty nest syndrome is to take a trip as soon as possible. Even if it's just a weekend, they say, get away somewhere fun and you'll forever associate empty nesting with something good. My daughter, already out of the house for two years, agrees, so my husband and I accept an invitation to visit friends in Hawaii. And just a few days in, hiking, swimming, drinking, I'm hardly thinking about the empty house waiting for me at all. That is, until the second to the last day, when I'm about to jump into the pool and I hear my cell phone ring. Tempted to let it go to voicemail, I think, it might be one of the kids. So I pick it up to take a look. It isn't one of the kids. The display reads, Carrie. Who is it? My husband calls from the pool. It's Carrie, I reply. The cat lady? I nod. <laughs> Carrie, eponymous owner and sole employee of Carrie's Critter Care, provider of quality care for domestic and exotic pets in the comfort of your own home. A fixture in our neighborhood, Carrie is hard to miss. She has this crazy curly hair and bizarre shoes with massive springs she purchases every year at the county fair, swearing they're the most comfortable things ever. <laughs> For the last few years when we go out of town, Carrie takes care of our cats, Lolly and Pop. And the truth is, she loves them more than we do. I figure she's calling to tell me about how Pop is going wild for the new laser pointer or that Lolly is really responding to the liver catnip. <laughs> Debating the wisdom of answering, I swipe right. Hello? Oh, hey, it's Carrie, she says. From Carrie's Critter Care? <laughs> As if I won't recognize her voice or have her number stored in my phone. Are you still in Hawaii? Yes, I say. We don't get back till tomorrow. Oh, so you didn't come home early? No. <laughs> Why? What's up? Carrie explains the back door was open when she arrived and Lolly is missing. She thought maybe we got back early and let Lolly out. I try to wrap my head around this thinking, she doesn't seem particularly alarmed the back door was open. Maybe she didn't lock it. And why would I let Lolly out? Our cats are inside cats. Oh, no, Carrie says, clearly walking as she talks. It looks like someone broke into the back bedroom. Someone broke in? My husband hears me. He swims over to the side of the pool. Carrie, you should go outside and call the police, I say. Oh, no, I don't think there's anyone here now. I'm just going to take a quick look. I can tell she's still moving around. The door to the garage is open. Oh, no. She keeps saying this. <laughs> oh, no. What? Is the car gone? Oh, no. The car's there, but weren't there bikes on those big hooks? You mean the bikes on the wall? They're gone. My performance bike, the one my husband bought me for my 42nd birthday when I started riding. I ride three times a week. The bike is like a part of my body. Carrie has moved inside. I begin pacing around the pool. The picture in the dining room, the pretty one of the boats on the water, that's gone too. And was there a picture by the door? She starts going through the house, reporting what's missing. There's no mess, just lots of empty hooks, hangers on the floor of our bedroom, gaps in the closet where items have been taken. I'll learn later they took dresses with designer labels or expensive feeling fabric and for some reason, sundresses. <laughs> Along with all the jewelry, my tennis clothes, and weirdly, they took my shoes, all of them? I stopped moving, I can't breathe. The one expensive piece of jewelry I have in the house, a ring my husband purchased when I hit 35, resides in a box, in a bag, in the toe, of an old, really worn brown boot on a top shelf. I've always considered this an excellent hiding place. Oh no, there's still some sandals and some boots. I'm dying to know if the ring is there, but just as I'm about to ask her to check, it occurs to me, 
can I trust the cat lady? <laughs> My husband is shaking his head, maybe thinking the same thing. <laughs> Carrie could say the ring isn't there, and I would never know if she took it, right now, after I tell her where to find it. <laughs> the phrase about curiosity killing the cat instantly comes to mind, but I have to know. So I ask, and she checks, and it's there. My daughter's room and my husband's office are relatively intact. I begin to breathe again, but momentary relief fades with a loud, oh no, <laughs> when Carrie gets to my son's room. All the shelves are empty. Empty, I say, and in an instant, sadness and confusion flip to rage. Because since he was six, and he saw this little iron replica of a beef eater at the Tower of London gift shop, my son has been collecting iron toy figures. Soldiers, mostly. Policemen, knights. For a decade. Every birthday. Christmas. From us, his parent, grandparents, aunts, uncles. These figures have been his prized possessions. And they are gone. All of them, except one lone broken joab. They took the iron soldiers, I say to my husband. Who fucking steals from a kid? I am suddenly totally pissed off because even though my son isn't really a kid anymore, the robber wouldn't know that, would he? <laughs> the next few hours go by in a blur. Carrie finds Lolly. We call the airline, talk to the police, call our insurance agent. And the next day, we arrive home to empty hooks, empty shelves, white dusting powder on flat surfaces left by the police. I stand in my closet thinking about someone shopping my stuff pulling things out, looking at labels, assessing them. I try not to think of them trying things on, but did they? I feel violated, sick to my stomach, vulnerable, and still really pissed off. Trying to control something, I spend hours compiling a list for the police report, discovering new things are gone. The camping backpack we bought our son for his graduation from high school, the necklace we gave our daughter on her 18th birthday, I drive over to the station house in Encinitas, naively thinking they'll have leads from the fingerprints, quickly learning the only prints they're likely to find are ours. The detective I meet is heavyset, no nonsense, gruff. I give him the list, explaining it's updated from the one we gave over the cat lady's phone the day the robbery was discovered, and he says, this wasn't a robbery, ma'am. A robbery is when the victim is present this was a burglary. Screw semantics, I think. We were robbed. From the looks of it, paintings, collectibles, jewelry, jewelry, dresses and shoes, this seems specific, personal even. Seems like they knew what they came to get. You know, anyone who needs cash? Friends, family, someone on drugs, maybe a friend of one of your kids, maybe this cat lady? I shake my head. My brain reeling with free associations, burglary, cat lady, cat burglary, <laughs> drugs. My stepdaughter up in LA is a former meth addict. A bunch of my kids' friends use drugs. They all have medical weed prescriptions, for God's sake. <laughs> Shit. Detective Gruff says the burglars must have pulled up some kind of truck and loaded it up. He asks if I noticed any suspicious trucks or vans on the street prior to the burglary. And what about this cat lady? How well do I know her? I explain she takes care of all of the neighborhood pets when people go out of town. Ah, he says, raising his eyebrows. There you go. <laughs> Maybe the perpetrators didn't know you. Maybe they follow her. Case houses she's going in and out of, figuring those people are out of town. While disturbing, this idea of someone following Carrie is somewhat comforting somehow better than being robbed by someone I know. He says they'll provide a police report, but I shouldn't expect much in the way of recovering our things. They don't have the manpower to follow up on this sort of crime. I should talk to neighbors, call if I notice unfamiliar vehicles on our street, track the bikes and the art on Craigslist and eBay, check pawn shops for the jewelry. He says thieves don't care what they get for stuff. It means nothing to them. They'll sell something worth 100 bucks for 10 This is both eye-opening and gut-wrenching. 
as is my next conversation with the insurance company when I'm told, you can't prevent evil. If someone wants to harm you, they'll find a way. I begin looking for evil. I become suspicious of everyone. People walking by the house, the pest control guy, the neighbors, my kids' friends, the cat lady, the cats. <laughs> the insurance company requires proof we owned our things in the first place. So along with online searching for our stuff and watching the neighborhood, I add combing through credit card statements, receipts, photographs, matching evidence to spreadsheet cells. An empty box that held the joabs my son got for Christmas, age 11. The photo taken at his graduation dinner in which I'm wearing shoes and a black skirt, both stolen. Another showing a watch, also stolen, that my son wore during his gap year at 18, traveling alone in India. It is a painful, time-consuming walk down memory lane. Since insurance only pays the depreciated value of an item unless we replace it, we try to replace most of the stolen stuff with similar stuff. But our things had no meaning for the burglar, and these things have no meaning for us. My son doesn't even open half the boxes of new iron soldiers. In the end, the burglars are not found. It takes two years to settle the insurance claim. We receive the last check around the time we sell the house to a young family with four boys, two sets of twins, age eight and 10, the ages my kids were when we first moved in. While packing, I ask my son about the unopened boxes of soldiers, and he shrugs, apologizes, adding, I know you spent a long time trying to find them, Mom, but and looking at my long past the age of collecting iron soldiers, son, I finally get it. The pain of an empty nest made emptier. The inability to recover what we lose, the need to move on. I tell him he can sell the replacement shoulders, soldiers, use the money for something else, and he pauses, gives me a half smile, and says, nah. I'm going to keep them for my kids. That was Anastasia. Is that right?